I'm a journalist who's been investigating journalism, in particular, how the British newspapers have presented immigrants and refugees and how our press regulator has intervened or not when things have gone wrong, when newspapers have not accurately reported what's been happening. And I haven't liked what I've seen, a daily deluge in some of our media that's spreading hatred towards migrants and refugees. And it should be said at the outset that the distinction between EU migrants, non-EU migrants, illegal migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees are not in these reports. They're lumped together. According to some British media, they're all the same. And in demonstrating this, I want to give some examples of some of the newspaper reports that I've been looking at lately. In particular, a report that led up to the lifting of work restrictions for Romanians and Bulgarians coming to Britain at the beginning of last year. And in the months leading up to that event, some of the British media were spreading great fear that 29 million Bulgarians and Romanians would now be allowed to come to Britain. Well, here was the Daily Mail online story about this. The Daily Mail is the world's most popular online newspaper with almost 200 million online readers. And here it is, confirming everyone's fears. From the 1st of January, the newspaper was claiming that all the planes and buses from Romania and Bulgaria to Britain were full up and sold out. They're on their way. And the readers, there were almost 1,800 comments underneath the story, pre-moderated comments from readers absolutely horrified. Our country's already full. Please don't come here. We don't want you. It shows my stomach to be invaded like this. So all this uh, hatred towards Romanians and Bulgarians in particular, and generally against migrants, was something that this story churned up. But actually, the story turned out to be completely untrue. Flights had not been doubled, as claimed by the Daily Mail, and in not very PR speak, Wizz Air press office told me it's complete rubbish. I was able to get seats on planes and buses which the Daily Mail claimed were completely full up. The Balkan Home Bus Company told me they had less bookings that year than the previous year and they had plenty of seats and I was able to book seats on the bus that the Daily Mail claimed was full up. Well, with my journalist colleague, Alina Mattis, an investigative journalist from Romania, we teamed up and we analyzed this Daily Mail story line by line and came up with 13 serious complaints. We even tracked down people who the Daily Mail claimed to have interviewed who said we were not interviewed. I presented 13 complaints to the Press Complaints Commission, now called IPSO, and it took seven months of investigation by uh, the Press Complaints Commission, during which time the actual condition of them investigating was that I should shut up. I had to remain quiet. I couldn't report anything for those seven months. At the end of the seven months, I was able to say on my own blog that actually, although they didn't agree with all the 13 complaints, the Press Complaints Commission agreed that the Daily Mail had broken the editor's code of uh, practice, which is their ethics code, on probably what is their most serious code one on accuracy. I put this on my blog, which is eu-rope.com. Uh, by the way, don't get my blog mixed up with eu-rope.co.uk, because I discovered not long ago that that site specializes in ropes for bondage. Nothing to do with me, Daily Mail, in case you might be in the audience. So I won, but the Press Complaints Commission refused to publish their findings. They refused to tell the Daily Mail that they had to tell the public that they had broken the editor's code of practice on accuracy. I'd spent seven months being silent, and if I hadn't published the results of our own press regulators' uh, deliberations on this, nobody would ever have known. And I just wonder 
I raised the question whether this has anything to do with it, because this guy, Paul Dacre, is the editor of the Daily Mail, but he has a second job too. He's also in charge of the editor's code of practice, not only for the Press Complaints Commission, but the new organization, IPSO, that's taken its place. I raised that as a question. Well, here's another newspaper, Daily Express. You might wonder, why am I concentrating on the Daily Mail and the Daily Express? Well, by far, they have more complaints against them than any other newspaper to our press regulator. This is a story from some years ago. Doesn't matter, because not much has changed in the intervening time. This is a typical Daily Express story against immigrants who are milking the system. And again, they don't distinguish uh, immigrants, asylum seekers, refugees, illegal immigrants, according to this story, they're all the same. I analysed it and came up with multiple factual errors in this story. It was complete nonsense. And yet, based on this, a lot of xenophobia is raised. For example, one inaccuracy. Hordes of illegal immigrants are queuing to be smuggled into Britain to claim benefits what the newspaper didn't tell anyone is that illegal immigrants are not entitled to any benefits. And you wonder, what is the motive for a newspaper like the Daily Express to do stories like this? Well, here's one idea. You can ring them and vote on where you think these illegal immigrants should get benefits that they're not entitled to get in the first place. If you vote yes or no, the Daily Express still makes a lot of money out of it. Here's a more recent story from August. Two Daily Mail stories about refugees from Calais coming to Britain. And you'll notice that in the headlines and in the first parts of the story, they don't refer to them as asylum seekers or refugees. They're referred to as illegals or illegal migrants. In the first story, it was claimed that these Calais stowaways, as they're called, were being put up in hotels, hundreds of them, according to the Daily Mail. In actual fact, the truth of the story was that 100 asylum seekers were put up in hotels temporarily, not for very long, and you can't really call them illegals. They were accepted as asylum seekers. In the second story, it said that seven out of 10 Cali migrants were getting into the UK. That was also untrue, and I'm going to come on to that. Let's deal with the first story briefly first. This is how the Daily Mail want to present these asylum seekers. Heaven forbid they're being given food. And to just demonstrate the point, let's see a sandwich and some chips. That's the sort of food these asylum seekers are being given. How awful. Welcome to Soft Touch UK where asylum seekers are going to get five pounds a day subsistence to live on. Terrible. And what about the other story? Well, this is the chief constable of Kent who told our parliament that within four months, 70% of the refugees, migrants, asylum seekers, whatever you want to call them, who are camped in what's known as the jungle in Calais, 70% of them within four months disperse. But no one really knows where they go. Some of them may come to Britain. Some of them may go to other parts of Europe or claim asylum in France. That's what he said. But what the Daily Mail chose to report was that the chief constable of Kent said that all of them come to Britain, all 70%. And based on those statistics, the Daily Mail statistics department was able to do some very convoluted numbers of people who were getting to Britain. I reported this to Parliament and to the Kent Police, they thanked me. The Kent Police insisted to the Daily Mail that they publish a correction, which they did, but the correction was incorrect. <laughs> so what does this lead to? A newspaper that can spread lies, that promotes xenophobia. So we end up with cartoons that are acceptable. Scylla, Scylla Black was a famous personality, a TV star, who had recently died. And here she is, queuing up to heaven, and the Daily Mail feel that they can say, sorry for the long queue into heaven, Scylla, but there's a lot of illegals who are ahead of you. Illegals mean asylum seekers. Asylum seekers, 2,600 of whom drowned on the Mediterranean. And this is how a leading newspaper in Great Britain is depicting that. Well, what's the difference between that sort of cartoon 
and this cartoon from Germany in 1936, where a Jewish man is shown politely asking for room on a bench, after which he shoves off the previous occupant, and the caption asserts that Jews behave in this way in other situations. What's the difference between that and this from the Daily Mail of August, where, because they say our hotels are full of these illegals, a British elderly couple are told they're going to have to tell these asylum seekers to shove over to make room for them. Well, only this week, Home Secretary of Great Britain, Theresa May, gave a speech to say how mass immigration to Britain was not good for the country. Mass immigration in a country where just 12% of our population is foreign-born, actually similar to Germany, similar to most other modern Western countries. Not that unusual, but she went on to say that immigration had zero value to the country. Immigration actually meant that British people were losing jobs. Is it any wonder that because of that rhetoric from our government, a government, incidentally, who is also planning to scrap our Human Rights Act and talking about leaving the European Convention on Human Rights, is it any wonder if the government can play that sort of rhetoric that we can have newspaper columnists, for instance, in The Sun, refer to migrants as cockroaches? And what she meant wasn't migrants, really, they're not using the right terminology. These are refugees and asylum seekers. Well, Genocide Watch is an organization that keeps an eye on these things. And they've said that there are actually eight steps to genocide. And for my reckoning, we're probably on step number three, the dehumanization of a group of people, in this case, migrants and refugees. They're all foreigners, talking about them as vermin and cockroaches, putting them across in a way which makes them subhuman. So from my observation, it looks to me that we have a media that promotes xenophobia. And I should add that there are millions of people in Great Britain who do not feel this way. There are millions of people in Britain who actually are supportive of refugees. There are hundreds of thousands of businesses who hire immigrants and are very pleased that they're available to be hired. But in the backdrop of media and government, it seems to me that we may well be on step three on the eight steps to genocide. And I really hope that I am wrong. Thank you. Thank you.